afternoon, everyone. Selena Sunny Banyas. I grew up on Carson Street, so in Government Hill. I, um, since I was 14 years old, I've been walking all of these streets because I had to walk down Carson through Fort Sam Houston when it used to be open and work right here at King Park since 14, so $1.40 an hour. Could you imagine that? Um, a little child labor law, something that we should look at. But, um, you know, I'm very familiar with this neighborhood, you know, between Sonic, the Witty, everything else back in the day, what it used to look like. Um, I am well informed of everything that's going on, some of the things that I want to work on in this area, of course, is public safety, making sure that we have access to transportation other than just vehicles, uh, because with all the construction, we're going to need other modes of transportation for this community. Um, of course, me growing up and living in Harvard Place, East Long, where I went to Wheatley, South Houston, St. Phillips, um, I understand all of the dynamics that come around with it. Um, I am a small business owner. Both my husband and I have a construction company. I do have a nonprofit that's called the Boardroom Project, where I teach young girls business using the bibliotech off of Walter, so utilizing that asset. Um, we got to make sure we have a streamline of women to become not only business owners, but board leaders that will impact their lives as well as ours on a daily basis. Um, I do serve on the board of Sarah, San Antonio Regional Alliance of the Homeless. And I believe uh, one of your neighbors, Brenda, is the ED as well. Uh, so if you want to inquire about the work I've done, she, you can just ask your neighbor as well as Lupita Gonzalez that lives in the neighborhood. Um, I look forward to being not a politician, but a public servant. So serving the community, serving the community as I have done before, during, and as I will continue uh, regardless of what happens today for us. So thank you very much once again, Selena Sampibanias. Um, and I look forward to meeting all of you this evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Tony, I'm your former counselor here. And I don't know if you've resolved your traffic issues from Fort Sam, my former employer. That's where I retired from. But I know you have those issues. Uh, and I know that that's something that needs to be worked on. Because your uh, streets became through ways. And not streets, uh, and I assume that probably the same thing going on right now. Uh, so we need to work on that. That's one of the things. Uh, not only was I a former council, I spent 15 years as a school board member in the Fort Sam Houston ISD. Uh, my wife's retired in the Army. I'm a Vietnam veteran. And uh, I'm proud of the Bronze Star brought back to Vietnam, but I'm proud of the sense of service I brought back as well. Um, because before that, it was about me. But Vietnam probably is not about you. It's about service to other people. And so that's why I'm running. Had no intention of running. My wife and I are retired. Um, when you talk about fixed incomes, we live on Social Security and retirement. So we're fixed income folks, so I understand that. So that's why I'm running, because people came to me and said, you need to get back into this. We need you to get back into it. What do you do? It's about service. It's not about self. And so that's why I'm running. And I appreciate your consideration for your vote. Glad you're here tonight. Look forward to your questions. Well, good evening, everyone. I am Jada Andrew Sullivan. I am a lifelong resident of District 2. I was born and raised right off of East Commerce and Honey. And I still reside there with my mother and my children. I decided to step into this arena, not understanding exactly what being a politician was, but definitely as a concerned community resident. I haven't done a lot of the things that Mr. Keith Tony has done in my life, but as I look forward to being your District 2 representative, I have worked with the San Antonio, City of San Antonio, and I was appointed to the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. I work with the NAACP on their veteran services. I also have moved forward with my church and making sure that we do community outreach by giving away gas, toys, food, clothes, our health fair. Those are just some of the things that I look forward to continuing to do on a larger level for District 2. As I walk the neighborhood, we heard many of the concerns of the community, and I plan to address those as much as possible. We have worked with developers. We have received our donations from some developers. But it's all in the act of doing something before you get in the seat that makes the difference. So as I stand here today, there are many great things that are coming to District 2. 
There are many great people that want to see a change in District 2. And if we work together in cohesiveness as one unit, we bridge the gap. And we do not have to fight amongst each other. We build amongst each other. And as candidates, we look forward to representing our district with our whole hearts. So thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruben Arciniega. My family has a 300-year history in San Antonio, specifically the east side. And in terms of a quick story, we have a small landscape, landscaping company called Bonita Landscapes. And one of our first clients in 1993 was a Miss King who lived right here. And I never, I recall she had a 1967 El Dorado Cadillac. But she's long since passed away, but I'll never forget how open she was with this along her for us to service her yard. But having said that, I've been educated at Texas Lutheran University. I've got my master's degree at UTSA, where I currently work in the Department of Civil Engineering. But like we've said, in many of these forums, the most powerful lessons that we learn are in our communities, specifically with the families, the peoples, and the leaders. And looking here today, I see the hallmarks of diversity, which essentially are the cornerstone and the strength of our community district too. What has to happen is our vision needs to change. We need to alter our trajectory. We have the ability to lead San Antonio as a people and as a community if we create one district too. We need to unify along community lines. I know we all have different needs, wants, and agendas. Mankey Park, Denver Heights, Wilshire, Roosevelt. However, if we can unify among the shared experiences that we currently have, we'll have more advocacy and a stronger unified voice in district too. One of the major challenges that we do face is the issue of stability. We've had a number of council people in the last five years. But I look toward the future, and I reclaim the notion that we can reclaim our future, and we can lead San Antonio as the premier district in all of San Antonio. Remember, we have the social capital. We have the people. We have the youth. So why can't we reach even further and higher? I believe this is possible. It can be done. But it'll take hard work backbone, and the ability to communicate those issues amongst all our clientele and our constituencies. So I look forward to the questions of today, and thank you. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Boss Perry. I grew up on the east side, grew up a knucklehead kid. Uh, I used to be a problem, now I'm a solution. My wife, uh, she's running for SASD school board in District 2. We're running because we're invested in the district. We bought our home three years ago. Uh, we have six kids in the district, and my wife works at St. Philip's College. We're both graduates at St. Philip's College. So we're invested, and we feel like the best way to show that you love the community is to invest in the community. So we bought a house right off of F Street in Longwood. And that area is very challenged with gunshots, violence, all sorts of things. But we invested in that area because we believe in that area and we believe in the people. I will our platform is simple. We want community engagement. Like what we're doing right now with you folks, we want to talk to you, we want to get your ideas, we want to get your opinions, we want to know how you feel about them because that's important. That's the number one thing. Public safety. You guys got to feel safe. I remember growing up, this used to be where prostitutes used to be right off the Broadway. So, you know, I know this city really, really well. Uh, another thing is economic development. You guys have done a tremendous job in transforming this from pretty much for prostitution to be so place of respect. And so you should give yourself a hand for that because we need to emulate you guys and try to do what you guys are doing. Another thing is uh, youth services. I'm a really big champion for youth services. I run a program called Suit Up where we help athletes to get uh, ahead in life and then we get them brand new suits and teach them how to talk to and simple things like that. But the most important thing right now is your property taxes. I'm going to be a champion for property taxes because as a new homeowner, I'm just learning about my property taxes. I just learned about the homestead exemption. So there's a lot about property taxes, home ownership, and everything I need to know. I need to teach my kids. And uh, that's what we need to sit down and figure out how do we get these taxes to, to stop kicking us out of our neighborhoods and the properties that y'all invested in and you just want to make a little money off of them. The taxes is more than what you're making off the property. So we got to try to find a way to uh, lower the taxes or freeze them. Thank you. My name is Walter Perry, and we want the job.
on my phone for a minute to answer your question. I'll just raise my hand from behind here. It's usually if you go over, but don't feel pressured or um, you know, don't take the time. But the way that we're going to ask questions too is we'll start with this Denise and she'll answer the words today, and then we'll rotate down the way so that Joseph will have an opportunity to answer first for the next question and Selena will have an opportunity to answer first for the next. So our first question this evening is that Lincoln Park is really proud to be a part of District 2. But it falls in an area of District 2 that is not inside the boundaries of the traditional east side. What issues do you see that face Lincoln Park that are different than those of the traditional east side? And how do you plan to give your attention to those issues that will require some extra time because they don't fit within the parameters? She was going to be. Well, right. Another four is we kind of, which was Just, four? Oh, which, which was it, honestly? Yeah. Which, which did you say? Okay, I'll find it. I'll find it. <laughs> We've had different forms, different ways we, we go. Um, okay, so. I'll go first. Give me. Give me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I do have a. I have a strong opinion about this, but y'all can probably make better opinions. This is a more generalized type of thing. Uh, I am just so uh, fed up with the fact that, that, that you can't drive through Fort Sam Houston anymore. I, kn I know that like we as a city council probably don't have that much of a say, but like, how much longer will our city and this neighborhood keep being directly affected by the September 11th terrorist attacks? I mean, like, come on, open the base up. Like, let us use it. That's where we used to play soccer. That's where we had all of, like, our childhood memories. Like, come on. I mean, open it back up. I think that's a very unique issue that faces this neighborhood, and I think it would greatly improve the flow of traffic. Thank you, Jim. So, um, I concur with Joe. We really do need to open up Fort Sackies. And as a child, once again, it was uh, me sneaking on base. I grew up on Carson Street, um, but having to walk through the base, but ultimately seeing all the businesses and everything that closed down um, just doesn't allow for the for the congestion. And if you really, if we really did open, and yes, Fort Sam is a, a city in its own, right? Like they literally want to dictate what happens and really has no influence. But from people who have had experience in the past or have been in these positions, you know, these are conversations we could have already established. Um, I'm all about connecting, making relationships, having conversations. Um, there is something, there should be no reason why we could not pressure that and make that happen. Um, but ultimately, with all the traffic, with all the bond, everything that's coming on Broadway, if we do not find a parallel route um, that will really alleviate some of this traffic congestion, I couldn't even get from Carson Street onto Broadway, and I attempted like five different shortcuts. So there's a lot that we can do and will do. One of the issues I think I see for you is that you're landlocked. I mean, you are just captive here. It, 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 it just blows my mind that you guys are just landlocked. So you, you, you just can't spread out horizontally. You got to go vertically. And then the city steps in and tells you you can't do that. So that makes it tough. Now, as for Fort Sam, back in 2014, 2015, there was a plan. There were several plans, but there was a plan for uh, an, un an underground tunnel, if you will, that would come out on the other side on New Braunfels Avenue. Now, I don't know what happened to that. I don't know if that was scuttled or what, but uh, and it, would, it was less than $25 million, which is the amount of money Hardberger Park got for that land bridge for deer and skunk to cross the road. So I just think there would have been money better spent to make it more convenient for you as residents, tax paying residents. So that's one option. I walked through the community and the biggest concern was your NCD is what everybody was concerned with. Um, the first one, the original one, worked well for the community. 
However, with all of the changes and the different ordinances that have come with the NCD, I heard a lot of people say that it affects the community totally. So when you talk about transportation on Broadway and you can't even get into your own community, that needs to be resolved. You need to have total access to where you live. And we as a community, as leaders for our district, need to make sure that our residents come first. So we need to address that along with making sure that everything that is needed within the community, from the speed limits to the scooters to the developments, are actually done properly and fit the needs of this community. Well, I would like to take the conversation maybe in a little bit of a different area, so to speak. Obviously, you are landlocked, and that brings its own host of issues in terms of the elderly population who do need routes in terms of going to the hospital and things like that. So that's a potential problem and one that's already struck, so to speak, and that has to be addressed immediately. But what I would say while doing some of the research here in the neighborhood, it was said that Airbnbs, this has one of the highest areas of density for Airbnbs. And of course, that brings its own set of issues, like we had said before, in terms of people not necessarily respecting the area that they're in, um, police having to come at different times of the night. And that goes back to the notion of what the city is trying to address in terms of the tier one and tier two properties. And what essentially what they're saying is, if you're a tier one Airbnb owner, so to speak, you actually live in the house that you're renting out or leasing in terms of the short-term rental. The second part of that, it's a tier two property, which to me seems to be the more immediate issue, and that is to say, you don't live in the actual building that you're leasing out. You actually live in a different residence altogether. You may not even be a district two resident. Thank you. Uh, can someone correct me if I'm wrong? This is the gate open? I thought they opened the gate already. Oh, part of the gate? Okay, part of the gate is open. I think the best... They changed the gate. They changed the gate. Okay. Okay. The question pretty much is, if, if I'm on saying, what's the best way to connect with the rest of the east side? Well, we kind of have like the same type of issue with property crime. Um, like I said, you guys have done a tremendous job of transforming your neighborhood, taking charge of your neighborhood, and doing the necessary changes yourselves. I think the best way to connect is to. Uh, you guys have a lot of small little bars and clubs over here, and I think connecting with some of the uh, small businesses over there on the east side, uh, some of the uh, black, Hispanic, and Asian, and other cultures, and bring a different flavor down here, so that way people can start seeing a different flavor down here. And uh, you guys have the style. It's just about bringing different types of cultures here and just making that mix in. So I think collaboration and just really just taking a chance to know different cultures. Well, you're dealing with drugs around you. You are in a very unique situation in San Antonio. You have Lucia, you have Breckenridge Park, you have the Shake Shack right now that is under construction. We have a discussion of the city park being moved into Breckenridge Park. You have an area of growth that brings in tourists and locals to your area, which means more traffic, more issues. I'm dealing with trying to wait and make sure that the kids and the parents walking to the museum over to Lionsfield to the park are literally walking in the middle of the street. Who designed that? And you know, you have to consider the fact when you're adding these type of amenities to our city, think of what's going to happen. You want them to go. That means more traffic. So think of the future. Just don't plant in the middle of a neighborhood along Broadway because you're going to increase tra traffic and safety issues. You also have the AT&T uh, AT building on the corner of Porter Van and Broadway that was just recently sold. You're going to have USA being your neighbor. The traffic's going to increase as well. So the fact is that the information that needs to be provided to you as a community needs to come from the city. You need to be involved with what they want to create here. There was discussion within your community not too long ago where I still see signs and not to be historic. There's good and bad about being historic. I live in a historic district, but the surrounding area of my government hill neighborhood is not. We're fighting an uphill battle because we can be historic, but the city still doesn't respect us. So is it a good or is it a bad thing? But you have community members in your neighborhood that are working to benefit you. So this is what we need to deal with, and we need to work together regarding how you want to see your future in your neighborhood. Thank you.
current councilman Art Paul has publicly stated that he supports the decisions of neighborhood associations and has made a conscious effort to work with neighborhood associations to resolve local issues. If you are elected, at what level will you work with neighborhood associations in District 2? So I think we've, uh, where we're at as a community and as a district, um, for too long we've been fragmented, we've been isolated, uh, whether it's Maggie Park or Government Hill, people just feel left out, people aren't talking from one side of the district to the other, um, and we really should be united, this is the time for us to come together, and to really say that at the end of the day we're all San Antonians, and we're all District 2 residents, and how can we help each other because one issue on one side is going to address the other, um, and so forth, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. I'm a firm believer is that go beyond neighborhood associations. Not every neighborhood association is the end-all, be-all. There are community groups, community organizations, there are individuals that work outside of the NA, so not only in addition to supporting the neighborhood associations, and instead of splitting them up in quadrants, I'll actually pair up uh, presidents that are more mature with more novice or neophytes so that they can then work together to teach each other of what has been going on and providing that history within a community. Um, so once again, we need to make sure that we're mentoring each other, but going beyond just the neighborhood association that uh, represents and supports our communities. I was a two-term neighborhood association president. So I know the value of the neighborhood associations. Large, small, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You are the voice of your neighborhood. Therefore, you are the voice of your community. You represent your community. And as a council person, again, because I've been a neighborhood association president, I know how vital it is to have a council person that has an open door policy for you. Many times you just want to be heard. Sometimes some things you can get done as a council person, some things you can't. But the thing is, have an open door policy for neighborhood associations. So you don't feel like you're being neglected or just ignored. And I've seen both of happen. I pledge not to do that. I thank you guys for having me. And as you speak about neighborhood associations, we've actually started going out, sitting down, talking to neighborhood associations. We haven't made it to all of you. And we know that that can be a problem if we don't have that accessibility accountability, transparency, and action. As I sat with the Councilman Art Hall, and I listened to some of the issues that came out of, of course, getting the wedding with the Hay Street Bridge, and I listened to what was lacking, and that was the voice that was not being listened to, and that was the communication that wasn't being had in unity with making sure that those needs of that community were truly met. So before you even get to the seat, you need to start working to make sure that those communities are actually heard wholeheartedly. So stop what you're doing and listen. To take accountability for what your community is wanting to do. And you serve them. And you become a servant of everything District 2 needs. Thank you. So what I would say is, neighborhood organizations here is the essential lifeblood of putting communities back together. And they're advocates for a neighborhood, they're voices for a people, but what needs to be recognized are the people that are necessarily not part of the neighborhood associations. And ultimately, that's really where the harder work comes in in terms of saying, how do we put them and allow them to be stakeholders in our community? So that's where the neighborhood association becomes more effective. What I would say, going back to the notion of neighborhood associations, is this. Not necessarily all of them have the same agendas, and that's okay, we can work along the shared experiences. But I do know in some instances, in certain neighborhood associations, and I'll say this and be upfront, there are certain elements that actually have commandeered the neighborhood associations and pushed a different agenda. And they don't they're pretty brazen about it. They don't necessarily hide some of the things that they want to do. So in all honesty, you have to say, you know what? I'll evaluate each of the neighborhood associations. If their notion is to commit and work for a community, then let's work with them. However, if we know there's a different agenda at play, then they need to be put to task as well. <coughs> Well, if I'm lucky to represent you, uh, we have a 90-day plan, which includes, we're going to meet frequently with the outgoing councilmen, so that way we can devise a transition plan 
because he, he, he already has things in place. Uh, we're going to meet to schedule a uh, District 2 strategic planning meeting. And we're going to meet with the uh, all the neighborhood associations. I'm, I'm aware that he has a president's meeting already going on, uh, Councilman Art Hall. So we want to keep that president's meeting going, but we want to expand it to more neighborhoods inside of District 2. The problem is, is that a lot of these neighborhood associations are not organized. And so we want to work to get these neighborhoods organized on their own. We don't want one neighborhood taking care of five neighborhoods. We want to get these neighborhoods self-sufficient, like you guys are, and get them on the path to where they can help themselves. It's all about the community helping themselves. It's all about the community helping themselves. Thank you. And one of them is in my neighborhood. And yes, we have issues because our neighborhood association no longer is representative of our neighborhood. We don't have a board. We have two members on our board right now. So this is public information. The fact is, when that happened, our neighborhood got together. We had to sign over 200 signatures to go to the city to say, you know what, we want a voice on an upcoming project because we weren't being heard. Those two members represented the entire neighborhood. We no longer had members because they weren't allowed to be members. Their membership was denied. Our meetings were closed. We weren't allowed in. So the fact is, when you are disenfranchised your own neighbors from joining the neighborhood, this is where the city council person comes in. Make sure everyone is heard. Don't exclude the entire neighborhood for a specific group of people who actually have been found to be working for a developer. So I would love On that note, people working for developers, Art Hall is out of touch, totally. One small example was why would he appoint a person to HDRC out of a million and a half people in San Antonio, a person who was formerly heavily involved in Alvo Beer working for the one of the most controversial firms in this whole debate over the use of the land. That doesn't make any sense, except that it happens in every single place you look. There is a small group of developers and people who have influenced this election for the past five years. So am I going to listen to the neighborhood associations? No way. And I don't even want your vote because most of y'all, sorry, and I'm sure there's a lot of good people here. Thank you for having me, but you do not represent the neighborhoods that you came to. I'm, I'm not kidding. I live in uh, uh, Big Oity Hill, and I see it all the time. And I see the way the developers come in and just put their own people and run people out who are longtime members of the neighborhoods. And I'm sorry. I just have to say thank you. immorality. If someone bought a house the year I was born and they raised their family and they paid their taxes, they paid their mortgage, and now they're of a certain age, it's immoral in the United States of America that they should have to worry about being removed from that home, their homestead where they raise their children, because they can't afford, they're struggling to pay taxes. It's just immoral. It's immoral. So, and I'm glad that the legislature is addressing this, so I'll move into that part of it. But they're not doing enough. It's almost too little too late. It's too little too late. We have to address this. Taxes should never be a reason for someone to lose their home. 
So yes, the legislature is moving in the right direction, as they tend to do. They're moving far too slowly, and they're not doing enough. So when it comes to the issue of property taxes, I look at my mother, and I know that she is proud to have the legacy that my grandparents left for her. But I've also seen her go down to the tax assessor's office and stand there to make arrangements. For me, that's a problem. I'm a 100% service uh, connected disabled vet. So for me, if I was to buy my own home, I would be 100% property tax them. But that doesn't speak to everyone that sits here. When you look at the issue of property taxes that are skyrocketing anywhere from 210% and up, you start looking at displacing a community. And when you start looking at displacing a community, then who are we actually serving? When the legislature said that they will implement a goal to help with property taxes, then they're saying, oh, but we'll have to raise the sales tax. So for me, who actually wins? Because now you're still passing that down to the person that is already struggling in one area to have to struggle in another. So we as a city truly need to implement the true homestead exemption for people who have owned their homes for 15 years or more to ensure that you have a home and a legacy to pass to your generations to come. Thank you. So in terms of the property tax issue, it's a very highly energetic issue because it's impacting Pretty much, I would say the majority of San Antonio, but specifically in terms of District 2, I bought my home 10 years ago. I'm from the east side, where I bought my 10 years ago. My mother bought hers in the early 80s. And it was at that time, because she lived right near the Alamo Dome, she said, you know what, we make it price out of the neighborhood. When your mother tells you that in 1988, you don't necessarily take it serious, considering the neighborhood. But you know what, her words have proven to be prophetic. Now we see that the city has used different measures in terms of talking about a potential tax freeze, which is something that we can look at and investigate, and I'm definitely for. We've looked at maybe issuing out what they call a city homestead uh, uh, act or initiative, and that could help you if, in fact, you're not elderly and you're not a mortgage owner. And so those are some things that we can look at, and of course, people need to know that they have the homestead exemption. That has to happen. But in terms of the second portion, which I think is more important in a sense, it's related to the state level. And they've kept the rate, the state legislature, and has capped the rate of property taxes, which is tied to your school financing, at 2.5%. Now, on the surface, that looks great because essentially what it says is, look, we're the good guys who are helping your community. But what's not told is the notion that it begins to dry up school financing, which impacts areas like here, like a Lamar, like a Douglas, like maybe Irving on the west side. So at this point, it's become somewhat a partisan issue. There's this notion or attitude that, well, the schools are shrinking. Or they're becoming smaller, so the issue isn't necessarily that impactful. And what I would say is we need to address that today and tomorrow. Yes, sir. Um, um, I think it starts with education. As I said before, uh, I'm a three year homeowner, and I just found out about the homestead exemption last year. And so a lot of people have been in their homes, and they don't know that they park off the homestead exemption. I looked at my tax bill. Uh, my homestead exemption went up from ten thousand to thirteen thousand. Uh, my taxes went up about another thousand, and so I'm trying to understand how the taxes are working with the itemized portion of it. And so education is where it starts at. And so for me, if you are someone who's invested into the neighborhood and you're giving a home to a family and you're helping keep somebody off the street, I think they should extend the homestead exemption to more than one property. I do. Mean, as, as, as long as you are helping the family and you don't have no Airbnb, I think you should uh, go ahead, they should go ahead and let you put that extra house on the homestead exemption if you own that house and you're providing uh, shelter for a family. But for me, like I said, this is about education and I'm going to be honest, I'm not a tax expert, but I'm learning every day. I'm going down there, I'm reading, and I'm talking to people, and I'm learning as a homeowner because I'm invested and I want to know. And uh, I want to work with neighborhoods that are having problems with taxes. And the biggest thing is that you guys just want to make a profit. Sometimes you, it's nothing wrong with making a profit off of something that you put your hard earned money into. And so as, as a councilman, I'm not against the government, but I'm against uh, justification. I am. Thank you. We are BPAD, 
and did we want to open it? No. Did we knew it was going to hit us. The fact is, the city can't answer why they're taxing us. They make excuses. They're not giving us numbers. They're not telling us where our money is going to go to. We know that our money, we are paying for the incentives to the developers. They're getting their freezes for 10 years. Wouldn't you like to have your property tax free and frozen and just stay stagnant for 10 years? Because the fact is, right now, I'm helping some of my neighbors look at their taxes. And so what I'm doing is I'm going on a VCA, and I would just would recommend you doing this too. There's a map application on VCA. Look at your neighbor's properties and see what their tax at. Some will have a tax in because of their age. But right now in my neighborhood, the homes that are being converted into bars and restaurants pay zero improvement on their back on their tax bill. Zero. The most I found right now is ten thousand dollars on the structure. We know they need to be taxed because I can see the square footage of a neighbor's home down the street, and they're being taxed out of their home. Why are they able to have their taxes frozen or not actually increased compared to the homeowners? This is where we need to think about legacy homeowners and legacy businesses. We need to keep those people around because they built our community, and we need to freeze our taxes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm not a tax expert either, but I did work at one of those income tax places for a while, but I quit because they were really predatory, like, you know, really high interest slip rates on the, on the loans that they were giving people on their refunds. And incidentally, uh, my refund this year was nearly as big as I thought it was going to be. And, uh, I wasn't able to pay my taxes on my house, so I started the process. Uh, it started with a lawyer at 12%. Uh, initial fee and an additional 1% amount. And then along with that is the uh, letters from the people who will help you pay your taxes, I guess, you know, if you sign over, you collateralize your house, essentially, to do that. Uh, so I don't see a huge difference between the payday loans, the, uh, the predatory tax refund people, and the way the city actually uh, implements it's policy to try to incentivize people to pay. I mean, it, it makes the city more money for them not to pay. So, but as far as the actual rates, I mean, everybody's saying, oh, they're so high, they're so high. Yeah, they're high, but I mean, we haven't had a, an increase in the cost of electricity in about like seven years for the most part. Um, that's a really long time, especially because when compared to the annual gain in the consumer price index. But if you look at how much CPS is a part of the actual city budget, it's much more than a normal city would have their energy company be a part of. So there's a lot to this, and I'm very solution oriented. So I've already created or started something, which means that I went to the tax appraiser myself. I had him create a due diligence checklist that was not ever done before so that homeowners know how to go about protesting their taxes, both in English and in Spanish. This was something that they've never had established already. But that means that when you go in front of a five-person panel and you have to protest your taxes, the average citizen is not prepared for that battle. So we need to make sure that we provide all of our residents the tools, the resources, the knowledge they need to not only protest their taxes, but to continue to fight for their property. Um, but I also want to state that, you know, in addition to homeowners, our city is comprised of 55% renters. So in addition to, which also votes, and their money is green, and they can pay taxes as well, maybe just not property taxes, but if their landlord cannot afford the tax increase on that house, they're going to go ahead and pass that, that fee along because it's, it's, we're unable. I mean, I too am a landlord, um, so I understand that, and I choose to eat up that cost because I know my tenants cannot pay that additional, you know, $1,000 per year. It, it's unrealistic. Uh, but we also need to be realistic here and say that it is the, com the commercials, the, the, the companies, the very large companies that are not paying their share fair and it's being put on us. So unless you actually have someone that's willing to fight for you and not be who they 
the chambers and everybody else, you better just expect the same thing from leadership as it's been. Thank you. As density increases along Broadway north of downtown, and current plans call for fewer lanes of traffic on an already busy motorway, what is your plan for balancing the need for growth with challenges that may arise due to changing traffic patterns and transportation options? When it comes to growth, cutting our lanes and making people unaccessible to where they need to go, we must address it now. Because as we continue to grow, we know that many people are going to use our highways and our byways to get to and from the areas that they travel. We must ensure that our children's safety is met first within our school areas to ensure that the buses can get through, the parents can pick up their children. And along this Broadway corridor, you're not just sitting there idling for about a good 10 to 15 minutes at a time. When you look at how Broadway is set up now coming into your neighborhood, Having one lane in the middle of five o'clock traffic is unspeakable. We must start looking at different ways to access our roadways as we come up Broadway. It's already narrow. If we make it narrower, how many people are going to truly be able to access that without being stuck, without having to waste gas, without raising emissions? These are the things that we must look at as we continue to grow as a community and as a city to make sure that our populations that are uh, critical to breathing and have asthma, COPD, and things of that nature are not affected by how we shrink traffic. Thank you. So again, traffic at this point is paralleling the growth that we face here in the city. And there's no one easy answer for it. But what I would say is there does need to be a need, aside from the notion of the bonding, how transparent that is, and the push for the, the, the work that's actually being done to be even done at a faster rate, because Broadway has been worked on for a minimum, I would say, 10 years that I've seen that. I talked to a city planner when I was in my 20s, so that tells me where we're at, right here at Bike Corner Ward. Um, but in short, what I would say is this. There needs to be alternative forms of transportation. A lot of our demographic is getting younger, and they're more flexible in terms of saying, look, I don't necessarily need a car. The jobs are being created in these, in these same areas, so why can't we look at bike lanes? Why can't we be comparable to something like Austin in terms of that? The scooter issue, I know, is a very controversial one, but they do help alleviate some of those concerns. People have become more pedestrian-oriented in the sense that they're willing to walk because now you have growth in terms of the bars, the restaurants, the museums, so people are able to get there likewise. But more importantly, this ties to the notion of a, a moral issue, and we need to continue to see that process through. Uh, the biggest thing for me is that as more people are coming into this area, they need to be safe. Uh, we've had, I think, two or three bicyclists killed. Uh, Tito Bradshaw and I forgot the other guy uh, out there by the community. So safety is the biggest issue over here. We have a lot of walkers. Uh, this is a beautiful area. The zoo, uh, you know, Brackenridge Park. There's so much stuff to do over here. There's so many people that walk up and down Broadway, across the street. Uh, so. I think safety is one of the things we need to focus on, making sure that whatever plan we come up with, that the traffic is not impeding on the tourists that are around here. Because Easter's coming up this weekend, so it's going to be a lot more people around here. So we got to make sure that people who are going up and down Broadway are not speeding. People are respecting pedestrians, and we're just respecting other cars as we pass by. And I think it'll, it's, it's all about respect. It's all about when you drive, you have to watch out for your neighbor. So I think safety is the biggest important thing to focus on safety. Yes, we have problems with our traffic. We also have to reevaluate how we get to and from work, to appointments, across town, because not everybody is comfortable with being here because it doesn't meet their schedule. So with that in mind, we need to think about looking at that because we own Via. And if it's not being efficient, there's something wrong with that. So maybe even privatizing, letting other companies in, in respect to maybe working with some of the companies here in town. We have Alma College with over 600 employees coming into our area. Maybe they even have something available for their employees because they don't work downtown. I mean, they work downtown, they don't live downtown. They might live in the far north area. More ride shares to get them down here to work. 
Same thing with freedoms. We have freedoms that go to the medical center. Do we know we have people that make a day event coming down to the museums, coming in the San Antonio Park, uh, San Antonio Museum of Art, coming down to the museum? Have freedoms for them as well. Because we are going to keep cars. And people say, well, we're not going to have a car. But now you have cars because we have lifted over. We keep cars coming. All right, well, there's, there's a relatively new saying uh, in Saudi Arabia. It's that my father drove an automobile, I have a jet, and my son will ride a camel. It's about the future of the fossil fuels and the way that our society is changing. If we say that we want the construction to end and we want to do construction the right way the first time and put an end to it, do it the right way. We know that the only way that we can have a sustainable footprint in San Antonio is to cut these lanes down. It's what the experts have told us. We're talking about billions of dollars in external costs of the health care that's required because of having so many fossil fuel, fuel burning vehicles in such a dense area. We, there will be a drastic change in the way that society functions. There will be driverless cars. Things will be very, very different. Let's plan for it. How many of y'all have heard that they were going to close down Mulberry Street? Nobody? Oh, they have plans coming up for y'all. Nobody tells you. It all, it's also like Brackenridge Park three years ago when they were going to close down and make this so that the cars would not enter. Once again, I didn't all of a sudden come out here because of election time, right? I've been walking these streets since I was a young girl. And when I worked at Kitty Park, the best part of a Sunday was seeing all the lowriders drive by on Broadway. That was my favorite time, and I still remember those days very clearly. If we do not do something about our congestion, if they close down Mulberry as they did they wanted to do for Brackenridge so cars could no longer enter, and they're not even informing the community. Even Kitty Park wasn't even aware of what Brackenridge was going on, what they had going on. I had to go and tell them myself. Look, I am a huge cyclist. I've cycled in Portland, I've cycled in Amsterdam, I've cycled in Vancouver, but it wasn't until I came home and got hit on my bicycle in front of Wheatley Middle School. And then I re I'm on my way to a safety committee on top of that, I cannot make this stuff up. So I understand the importance of having other modes of transportation. I've taken the bus since I was a child. Ten cents is what it used to cost us to get on the bus. If we do not figure out something, we are going to be in the same position as we have been. Thank you. Not every option will fit every area of district or of the city. But you're unique again. Let me get back to that. You are really congested here. It is so bad. You're a bottleneck right here in your little area on Broadway. So we need to look at transportation options. And, and again, I know that the cost is always rearing its head. Uh, we, we need to know what the cost will be. But we do have all of these companies that want to come in here, these major corporations, developers, as a condition of doing business here, building here, they're going to make a ton of money or they wouldn't want to come. Why don't we have them kick in for something specific? Transportation, alternative transportation, so that we can, and, and it can be targeted, maybe not to the, the entire city, but certainly your Broadway quarter. So let's look at, as Ruben said, enhanced bike lanes, and I mean enhanced, so enhanced for safety. And there's got to there's be more technology. So, enhanced bike lanes and uh, trolleys. Thank you. As it relates to Mickey Park's current housing stock, we are experiencing very drastic and quick changes in the way that the face of our neighborhood is looking. A lot of that spurred the conversation that this is this data referenced earlier about our MCD, our Neighborhood Conservation District. And we are continuing to experience development. What approach will you as a council member take to managing that development and the different opinions that will come to it in our neighborhood? And then how do you plan to balance the positive impacts of development with negative consequences? So 
So development is the big boogie monster that we typically throw out there. But specifically, we need to look at the details of what that is. Essentially, we have development that comes in the form of condos, apartment complexes, and bigger uh, entities like that. The other part of it comes in the form of people doing individual rehab. But at the end of the day, no matter what agenda you do have, you have to be able to push the notion that development is here and we have to grapple with the new reality of it. But it can't come at the cost of people losing their homes, of people being taxed out of the area, and then saying, well, that's progress. You need to be able to sacrifice. What has to happen is this. It's a very simple approach. You have to have a council lead that has a backbone that won't be able to say, will say one thing that you want to hear in terms of pandering or just saying whatever we need to say out here so that everyone can clap for you. But then as soon as you get with the developer, they'll sit there and drive an agenda. And you're just a conduit for it. Now, that's happened before in terms of the council people that we've had. Not necessarily just D2. That's something that happens throughout San Antonio across the country. So what I say is this. I issue a challenge. It becomes a character test in terms of who has the backbone to address those issues and who has the backbone to stand firm for your neighborhood. As I said, I will um, work with the neighborhood associations, work with the community, have uh, talks and discussions like this one. Uh, also, I will form what do you call it, like a special projects committee, so that way we can go into the community and talk to people who who know what's going on because I know there's a lot of stuff that's going on. I know a few of the projects that's happening in the district too. And for me, I think it's it's important to get people who know the area, who know how to talk to different people, and just make sure that we have the proper oversight. One of the biggest things that I have in, I, I was at Sage, I used to work at Sage for two years. And the biggest things that we saw out of developers is that none of them came with impact studies. They wanted to do development, but there was no impact study to show how that development was going to impact that neighborhood. They just wanted to make money. And so I think everybody should be honest first and tell the community how this, how with the project you want to do is going to impact the community and help the community. Thank you. hurts your feelings, but these skinny houses over here in Yankee Park, uh, I understand that they built them. Oh, yeah. I did a lot of uh, block walking here, too, and uh, everybody knows that Yankee Park matters so much to District 2 and District 2 candidates because this is where you can get the most donations. So it's a really <laughs> great place to go and knock on the doors. So I was going around knocking on the doors. It's, it's such a great place to do that. I found out that the skinny houses, at least some of them, are being built with like green materials, and so I guess it's all right. But I mean, they're so close together. I don't see how the the mud. Uh, I don't see how the grass is ever going to grow between them. I feel like it's just going to turn into mud and erosion eventually, and the building quality as well. Um, I think Maggie Park is an example of what we don't want development to look like. At least what I've been seeing. Once again, with my construction background, I see a lot of homes that 
are repaired or turned into Airbnb, but they're, it's subpar work, right? So you have people coming in, doing half jobs, and not really fulfilling the needs that they have to by code compliance and so forth. So that's just a quick turnaround in, what we're, we're, in which we can improve things right now, right? Just the level in which we're providing uh, and building our homes because we, we want these homes to last for very long. The second thing is, unless we appoint people onto our boards and commissions that actually reflect not only your council member, but the community itself, and not, you know, selecting friends or selecting individuals that can rub your, you know, scratch your back and I scratch yours, and they have no idea what a, um, zoning is or anything else like that. They just, you know, that's really why our city does not move forward. This is why our district does not move forward because we keep on having the same mediocre, mediocre leadership instead of having people push forward and representing the community as a whole. Thank you. Not all development is bad, but certainly not all development is good either. If you live in Manky Park, Denver Heights, it's not unusual to have 100 year old homes, as Joseph said, he's 100% correct. And those homes have character. Now, how do you define that? It's like a train wreck. You know it when you see it. You may not be able to define it, but you know a 100 year old home has character. And you look at some of these things that they're building now just have absolutely no character. And I try to think, what will this thing look like in 60 years? I won't know. But I try to project that. And I think it's just going to be horrendous if it's still there in 60 years. I really do, because the workmanship is shoddy and you can tell. Our communities just can't be for sale, folks. I mean, it's okay, we can't stop it. I guess it's development to America if you have the money and you want to develop and go through the system. But that's where the problem lies downtown. Make them, hold them accountable. Hold them accountable. If you say you only want a certain kind of architecture in your community, that's what downtown is. First thing is increased transparency uh, between constituents and the city council. I may not be the most fluent with this, but I'm straight up, I won't lie to you, and you can always call me on the phone and tell me that kind of feel. Another thing is, I'm going to work really, really hard to make this place look a lot better, especially on the inside, and work on solving crime. We have a lot of gang violence over there, and I want to work hard and work with the youth over there and get these people on the right track and get those neighborhoods back on the right track. So you can expect that from me. Thank you. In my first 
your study days of a book that you have to sign plan that actually plan. I think it's one of the most important things on the agenda. We live in an ever-changing world, and it seems that as time goes on, we are ever closer to doing ourselves to ecological catastrophe. I think that when it comes to deciding whether to act or not to act, when the end and final and worst possible outcome is the death of all mankind, even if that is only one tenth of one one hundredth of one percent, we should act against that. That is what a proper risk management policy would look like. It involved it starts with shutting down the coal burning plants, which is the ones that Calendar and Slate, the spruces, the second spruces unit has to go and you're not gonna let me anyway. So we need to raise the uh, the the utility fees. We just have to raise it, okay, by twelve percent over a four year period. Thank you. So you can expect from me in the first six months to clean house. That's as simple as it is. I plan on cleaning house. We have so much conflict of interest on various organizations, various industries, various chambers. There are, that once again is why our city has not moved forward, right? Not only our city, but our district. So my first six months will be cleaning house. I also got endorsed by the uh, bicycle and ridership organization because once again, I am an enthusiast of not only cycling, but safety. And so I'm going to make sure that all of our bike line lanes, we have parallel routes are, in, are already addressed and figured out. Being proactive versus reactive, not waiting until after the fact, or losing another life, which we shouldn't have lost those lives to begin with. Um, at my 12 month mark, I'm going to talk to companies, but unless these companies are going to ensure through their community action plan that they are going to employ people from the district, that is how we will address crime, is by having jobs for people. My cell phone number is 210-471-9941. 210-471-9941. In office, out of office, doesn't matter. Call me. Open to a policy. Call me. Can't be everywhere. I know that from experience. But when I can, I'll come. Not a staffer. I'll come. They bring a staffer. But I'll come an open door policy to listen to you, to listen to your concerns. Thanks so much. So as your city councilwoman, desperately speaking for my community and making sure that you come to the table, making sure that your voice is heard, making sure that the community has the action that it needs behind it. So full transparency, full accountability, Full access is exactly what you'll get from me from today until the day that I'm no longer able to be appointed, elected into that seat. Thank you. So there's two parts to this answer. In terms of our vision, like I said, we want to alter where we are at. We can leave San Antonio, but that can be done by unifying all of District 2. Again, we can't be fractured. And then when we approach City Hall, say, well, we want to push this policy or this agenda. Because the second part to that, which is more effective and we've not talked about, is although we have these views, when you get to City Hall, you're going to have to negotiate a compact with people that have a different viewpoint, a different agenda, a different type of constituency. If you're going to lay down, if you're going to give up, if you're going to say, well, I can't do these things with them, we're going to end up in the same place in two years. Mm. 
Yes, I mean, my support is broken, yes. Yes, by all means. Yes. 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 Do you support a city ordinance to require a living wage for all public employees and employees of private contractors within the city? Yes, I support a living wage for all members of the city. Yes, long overdue. Yes. 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 The same, but would you publicly support a state law? Yes, I would. Yes. 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 Thank you. Our last one is specific to Nikki Park. We had lots of neighbors individually and collectively come together and suggest this. Would you support a speed limit change of 25 miles an hour on residential streets? Yes. 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 Yes, but it better be enforced. Mm -hmm. I would. So I don't know if anybody has heard of this book, but Shantaram, 900 pages, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm an avid reader. I'm a voracious reader. Um, in addition to Shantaram, I'm just a really buff, but a uh, lover, but man, there's so many good ones. This is really putting me on the spot. Um, I really haven't even thought of one, so uh, I'm just a foreign film lover. So anything from foreign films, um, I'll just I can't even think just because there's so many names. Let me uh, I'll pass on that to come back. Yeah. The book uh, I, I bought for my wife, and she was very upset because I took it and, and I read it before I gave it to her. It was Becoming by Michelle Obama, and my favorite movie of all time. So the last book I read from cover to cover would be The Outsiders, um, and I just kind of put the movie with the book, um, because that is one of my favorite movies. I love how you can just truly step outside and become something better than where you come from. 
So um, in terms of reading, I read the San Antonio Heron, which is a blog, it's a community blog, which I love. And then the book is Bless Me Ultima by Rodolfo Anaya, it's one of my favorite books, in fact, it's my favorite. And in terms of movies, I don't want to get over dramatic or sad, but uh, in third grade at St. Gerard, we watched Glory. And uh, that's the first time as a young boy I've seen where good didn't, good didn't necessarily always win. And it really shook me, and that movie's always saved with me, and I love that movie. Uh, I love the book that I heard from Company Club. It's called The Master Key System by Charles Hino. Uh, it's a very good book, actually. They have the audio version of it, too. Also, my favorite movie is Anything Eddie Murphy. Trading Places, Beverly Hills Cop, 48 Hours, Raw, The Lyrics, Come to America. So I'm a really big Eddie Murphy fan. And so you put on Eddie Murphy, and we can have all day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys, and now we'll start at this end, since we started at the other end. You have a minute to do a closing statement. Hello, folks. Thank you again for having me. Uh, my name is Walter Perry, and I'm asking for your vote. Uh, I'm asking you to vote. It's 175,000 people in District 2, and over the years, our voting numbers have been extra, just disgraceful. So right now, I want to make a call to action to all of you little folks to go to the polls and vote. And let's send a message to City Hall and District 2, Mankey Park, and all of the neighborhoods are engaged. We are ready to change the direction of our city. And we want to take control of our own lives here in the city, and we're just tired of it. So I want you guys to vote. There's some really good people up here. We're all passionate about the community. Even if you don't vote for me, vote for somebody. But go vote, because your vote matters. We want to send a message. So I'm asking for 20,000, at least 20,000 votes. I want to see that during early vote. Please make me proud, and please, please, please go vote. Thank you. Once again, thank you for this evening. Uh, my name is Ruben Arciniega, and essentially what I'll say is this. I believe District 2 can be the lead community in all of San Antonio, and I believe that with all my heart. But more importantly, there's a number of issues that we have to address, but that has to be done by unifying all our community, no matter what part of the East Side that you live on. Um, and in the end, what I say is this, no matter the outcome of what happens, I don't ask that you commit to me. I just ask and respectfully ask and request that you continue committing to your community. Because if that happens, then we'll be transformative and we'll change the things that we want to change. If that doesn't happen, and we'll be back at the same place in two years with other candidates. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. I'm Jada Andrew Sullivan. As I stand in front of you, just remember I'm not a politician. I'm just a concerned community member. I look like you. I speak like you for my community. There's harmony in unity. And there's harmony when we speak together. If we stand with each other, and we stand connected as a unit within District 2, we move mountains. We are the shining light that can lead an example to what you can do when you truly work together and you speak for those that have not been heard. So I stand in front of you and I ask that you speak for your district, that you speak for your community, and that we all speak together. Thank you. Well, I'm Keith Tony, and I, I don't want any other political office after this. I'm not qualified to be a judge, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I don't want anything else. I don't need any more titles. I've been called the president of the school board. I've been called a councilman. I've done all that kind of thing. And the best title in the world, other than being somebody's husband, and I've been somebody's husband for 43 years, but it's, it's that I have five young people on this earth who call me Paul. And that's the best thing in the world. So I'm not looking for anything else. And I'll tell you this, District 2 is comprised of what folks call the Northeast Side, the Southeast Side, the Near East Side, and the Broadway Court. So that's like having a child that doesn't have the same last name as everybody else in the family. So I've, I've taken to call you Broadway East. So you're East too, because we're all in this together. Well, you've heard us all say that, that everybody's unique, but we're all in this together. We're all District 2. I know you may not feel like that sometimes, but we're all District 2. I've never forgotten it. I won't forget it. Forget it. Thank you for having us tonight. You just heard 
talk to her about her one thing, Vote Selena. Vote Selena. At the end of the day, um, I did not just show up on the scenes. I've been walking and working since I was 14 years old, if not younger. Those were just what was put on the books, right? I have been working, and I know that many of you have been working that long, if not longer in your lifetime. And you deserve better. You deserve to have leadership that's not only going to speak on your behalf, but hold responsibility and accountability. You can go look at my financial report and see that all of the donors are individual small donors, community members, and residents like yourself. There are no developers. There are no big wigs. There are no presidents. These are people that believe in me and see in me the same thing that they believe. So go do your homework. This has been more than just a campaign. This has been a movement. Since I put myself out there and forward, I have decided, I have signed up more and registered more than 50 people to vote. That is not about me. That is about us as a district. Thank you, and I humbly ask for your votes. Thank you once again, I'm just pal. As uh, I think most of us have already observed, the growth rate in this city is absolutely unsustainable, uh, and the only way to stop that is to enact policies that slow the growth rate. And why we should slow that is because it, it, it <coughs> sorry, uh, puts upon the people the price shocks associated with raising rent increases faster than a certain percent amount per year. Otherwise, it would be sustainable. At this point, it's not. And the people who suffer from this are not the people who can afford housing uh, in this in this new economy. Anyways, uh, it increases crime. It increases crime. It adds to, it exacerbates the commodification of human suffering and the corporate profiteering of the criminal justice system uh, within our city and within our nation. Uh, we need to do things to slow growth. We need a massive shift in the tax burden from individuals to business. Capitalism is an abject failure. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 